Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening as well. This is Joseph Trevisani for Worldwide Markets. Today's topic is a bit touchy, I think, and I will try to keep it from the non-emotional level. should be relatively easy for me because I'm an American, and uh, my view of the European Union is both historical as well as current, uh, political as well as economic and financial. So let's talk first about the what's pending for Europe this year, just in terms of the background of practicality so that we know what's up. Because these decisions are going to make a great deal of importance. Uh, and they are democratic decisions, which gives them a degree of unpredictability that would clearly not be the case otherwise. If the parties in Europe were making the decision, just like in the United States or in Britain, if the, in Britain, for example, they came first, if the parties, Labour or the Tories, the Conservatives, had made the decision about the vote to leave the European Union, one, the vote never would have taken place, and two, if it was decided in Parliament rather than as a referendum, there is zero question that it would have failed. It didn't matter. In fact, the Conservatives, the Tories, of course, of running England, a Great Britain, but were the Labour Party in charge? The result on this particular topic would have been exactly the same. Neither party, neither party philosophy, neither party members want, wanted to leave the European Union. In the United States, the new president, Donald Trump, is skeptical of many of the arrangements that have existed politically and economically since, the, uh, have grown, shall we say, since the Second World War. He is overtly skeptical of trade pacts. He is, if not skeptical about its purpose, he's certainly skeptical about the financing of NATO. He's skeptical about the euro. So these are views totally at odds with the ruling ideas of both the Democrats and the Republican parties here in the United States. When Mr. Trump, let's go back to Britain, by and large, the Brexit vote ran against the city, meaning London's financial district, the opinion there. It ran against the Tory hierarchy and it ran against the labor hierarchy. It ran against the establishment by any definition that you want to call it, and it won here in the United States. The election of Donald Trump ran against the Republican Party, his own, ostensibly his own party. It ran against the Democrats clearly, and it ran, and he ran against the Washington establishment. Every government in our modern, complicated world has a permanent staff that has its own views, that has its own interests, and whose opinions are notoriously difficult to change. It's true in Europe, it's true here, it's really true everywhere in the world. It's a natural function of established human societies, organized the way ours are. So with those two notices behind us, you could also add in, of course, the Italian vote recently on the arcane subject of constitutional reform. There's little doubt that the Italian overwhelming rejection of that constitutional reform had almost nothing to do 
with the constitutional reform itself. It became a vote on Matteo Renzi's premiership and a rejection of Matteo Renzi's premiership. Now, what were people rejecting? Difficult to say since there wasn't a lot of, there were no real platforms uh, or candidates to represent a vision, such as Marine Le Pen in France, we'll talk about in a minute, certainly represents a vision for the continent and a vision for France. You didn't see that in Italy. What did you see? You saw a inchoate rejection of the status quo. Much as here in the United States with this vote, I think that the most sensible interpretation of this vote for Donald Trump, despite the media's overt antipathy to his candidacy, and it continues today, something substantial, something important, something profound, I think, was being rejected here. It is most likely the same thing that was rejected in Brexit and the same thing that was rejected in the Italian vote. Okay, so I think we, we would all agree, even if we don't agree on the cause, or even more importantly, whether this view is correct, that these three votes, these three movements, if you will, have something in common. So what is up for the continent this year? Well. See this little country up here? The Netherlands, Holland. The uh, original, uh, well, not the original, the second great purveyor of globalism. What do I mean by that? Well, the first nation to establish global trade links was Portugal. This little nation right here with Prince Henry the Navigator and the route to Asia around the Cape of Good Hope, around the southern tip of Africa, which took place late in the 15th century. Portugal acquired an empire, Portuguese East Africa, Mozambique, which lasted until the middle late middle of the 20th century, I think until about 1977, if I'm correct. That is 400 years. Actually, that's 500 years, 1477 to 1970, it's 500 years, um, and Asia. And after that, it was the Dutch following uh, the same route who founded the Dusty Gingies and with the latter protection of the British, the British Navy and the British Empire, retains that until the 1960s. These are early, the first, you could say, modern globalization, but the trend is exactly the same, although exhibited differently. Well, this early proponent of globalism, of global trade, is about to vote, I believe in March, um, has a national election. And a nationalist party, um, you know, I forget the name of it, uh, at least in Dutch, Let, uh, but I know the name, of course, the leader, Gert Wilders, um, is in the lead for that election. Not only is Mr. Wilders um, a proponent of restricting immigration, he is also a proponent of leaving the euro and the EU. The EU in Brussels, which is, of course, down here, is about to head into its most traumatic year. And, this in, and I include, of course, the Greek debt crisis. The Greek debt crisis never threatened the EU. 
Greece is a tiny economy. It is peripheral to the EU. It is a late member of the EU. And despite its central position in Western culture, at least ancient Greece, it is hardly central to anything of Eastern Europe, of Western Europe now. That is why, of course, Germany and the EU was able to impose such stringent rules, such stringent terms on the Greek economy after the various collapses of the uh, Greek debt. That is not true of what is happening this year. If Greece had left the EU or the euro, it would have made almost no difference. It would have mattered a lot to the Greeks, but it would not have mattered at all to Europe. I wouldn't say at all, but very little. After it revealed that the Greeks basically um, did not tell the truth, with I believe the help of Goldman Sachs, um, about their ascension to the EU and the terms for the financial agreements that led to their having the proper economic and financial criteria, which were largely made up. So although that seemed traumatic at the time for the EU, and it certainly was, it made for great trading, as we all know, it did not threaten the EU. What's coming up this year most directly does threaten the EU. So let's talk about what is happening just briefly in terms this year. And then we will give a brief, I'll give a brief history, I think, of the EU, which I, I imagine most everybody knows, and it's pretty much portrayed right here on your, on your screen. But I'll just talk about that a little bit. Then we're going to talk about what I think is key, is the changing attitude of Germany. But let's take things one at a time. So what do we have this year? Well, in March, we have the election in the Netherlands, Holland. All those wonderful 16th and 17th century paintings had come from. One of the things they come from was the Dutch economic prosperity based on the Dutch East India Company and Asian trade, globalization. They even predated England in this, and they were much more successful at it than the Portuguese. So if there was any European nation that historically is an emblem of globalization, it is, to my mind, Holland. The democratic Protestant Dutch burghers concept of the purposes of trade and politics. And this same country, at the heart of the European Union, one of the original members of the European Union. Now, okay, I'll talk about that in a second, so we'll just keep going is probably going to vote a plurality to an anti-globalization party. One would have to look at this effect and say, what went wrong? Now, of course, what went wrong, among many other things, were two world wars in Europe that devastated the continent. The continent has recovered. It's a question whether its spirit has, but that's another question. From the practical point of view right now, much as Donald Trump has encountered an entrenched, long-serving bureaucracy opposed to almost all of his ideas, certainly his international ideas, you would have the same thing in the Netherlands, if Gert Wilders, one, wins a plurality, and two, can form a government. Um, even if he gets, I think he's polling somewhere in the low to mid-20s right now, which by a, his party, which is by a few points a plurality, meaning it's the most, but it's clearly not a majority. They have a parliamentary coalition system generally there. Most governments are, almost all governments are coalitions. So... In order to form a government, Mr. Wilders would have to 
form would have to come in agreement with a number of other parties to gain a majority in the Dutch legislature. Da, da, da. And then the other parties have said they will not work with them. That remains to be seen. The attractions of forming a government have a tendency to subsume, at least initially, political differences. The ideological purists are rare. And I think from a practical point of view, we should all be glad they are rare. So that election's in March. However, it turns out, the only thing that will boost the euro and the European Union and their prospects at this point is a thorough trashing of Mr. Wilder's party, and that does not appear to be in the cards. Now, Holland is not a large member of the EU, but it is a very important symbolic member, I think, for the reasons that I've discussed. So their election is in March. We have to go with the polls, although going with the polls in the, uh, the last two elections of importance, Brexit and the United States presidential election, did not really benefit anybody, did they? Brexit was supposed to lose by a number of points. It won by the same amount. And Donald Trump was supposed to lose by a huge amount in the Electoral College, and he actually won by a huge amount in the Electoral College. So the polling data has been, shall we say, questionable. Reasons for that, which we will not go into. Okay, so the only thing I'd say about that is the polls that are currently what was clearly true in the polls in Britain and the United States is they, they were inaccurately capturing the actual sentiment in the country. That if that is true equally in Holland, then the polls there are probably underestimating the vote and perhaps the power after the election of Gert Wilders. We don't know, we will find out in two months. It will be a good trading night for everybody. I, was everybody out, uh, up, I stayed up uh, working and tweeting and um, commenting on the American election night. It was a fantastic night for trading, that's for sure. Um, so I think we'll probably get something like this for the Dutch election. Whatever, unless, as I said, unless it, it happens that Mr. Wilders goes down to a stinging defeat, far less than the polls are predicting at the moment for his vote total, it is going to be a bad night. Whether or not he's able to form a government in the subsequent weeks, it's going to be a bad night for the euro and a bad night for the EU. Because the conflict between this party, Mr. Wilder's stance, and the philosophy and the goals of the EU could not be starker. Although you haven't heard much about it anymore, the ever closer union is the goal of the European Union. It is most assuredly, in concept, the formation or the attempt to form a federal state. Now, I've spoken about this a number of times because this leads right to the one of my favorite topics, the permanence and the strength of human culture and our tribal nature. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. So the election in Holland will be a direct challenge and is a direct challenge to the European Union and certainly the Euro. And then we move on to France, which is having a scrambled election, but again, one of the main candidates and one of the likely winners of the first round, the French have elections in, in two rounds. They have a number of candidates running in the first round and then the top two have a runoff. Is expected at the moment to be Marine Le Pen, who just gave a speech in Lyon 
although I saw it written up by various, uh, you know, it's amazing. No matter the, I was reading, I started reading a, a Reuters dispatch on it, and it's like they have a style book that says, Marine Le Pen National Front must be prefaced with the adjective far right. I don't see any purpose with this as far as categorizing a political party and a political movement. If you want to present it, then present it. We do not need your adjectives to let us know what to think. At any rate, so I skipped the Reuters write-up of Marie Le Pen's speech, and I, and I read a number of others. And one of her topics was globalization, which she doesn't think is a very good idea. She doesn't think that it is benefiting France. And more, she thinks that it's actively damaging France. She thinks that the ideas, uh, the permissions, if you will, are underlining French, undermining French culture, French values, the idea of France, if you will. What is her standing in the election? About 25%, I believe, right now. Again, they have the same type of divided uh, initial election. But for those two countries, and let's just take those, because those have scheduled elections right now. The Germans do too, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, actually, I wrote down the German election. It's in September, I believe. Yeah, September 2017. Okay. This is undoubtedly the first time on a national watched scale that there is going to be a huge, how are the outcome of the election? The elections, there's going to be a huge protest vote in Europe against globalization, against the EU, and against the euro. The scale, we don't know yet, but the advent is astonishing. You can look for the reasons, and, and many of them are available, uh, at least on fine speculation goes. I'm going to try and keep to the, the reasons, the economic reasons, but th that does, unfortunately, in a organization like the EU stray over to the political and historical. So let's, let's finish with the title, with the uh, election. So we have <clears throat> Holland, and then we have France in March, where it almost seems assured, at the very least, there's going to be an enormous protest vote. You cannot ignore 25% of your electorate. I mean, you can, but it's a really bad idea. So however these the political denouement of these elections plays out, meaning does Gerd Wilders become prime minister, does Marine Le Pen become president, the vote will have and should have profound implications for the European project, as they call it. After that, we have German elections in September. Merkel is expected to handily win, but I think there is probably, as with other countries that we've seen this year, more going on there than is being captured by the polls and the commentary. How much more, I don't know, we'll see. In, in Britain, in the United States, in Holland, and in France, there are political leaders whose that can galvanize, that can motivate, for whom this is a political opportunity. And it's something they've been saying for many years. This is not something that they do, that Gerd Wilders developed late in 2016, or maybe the summer of 2016, watching the Brexit vote, and then uh, in November, the U.S. presidential election. That's not the case. This has been his position for a long time. And the same is true of Marine Le Pen. So I'm thinking that we can probably, at least as far as the threat to the EU and the EMU, we can probably 
distance ourselves a bit from the German election. But then, of course, there is the Italian election, which is not called yet. The rejection of Matteo Renzi was, I am sure, the same type of fervor that has been going through that we have seen in Britain, the United States, and are seeing without political conclusion in Holland and France. The major political party leading the polls in Italy calls itself a movement, not a party. <clears throat> It is headed by, I think, a 62-year-old uh, ex, and this is, this is again, yeah, and his name is Pepe Grillo. I don't know what his real name is. It's not Pepe. Um, and as with Reuters naming Marine Le Pen's far-right party and saying it every time, pretty much every time you see a write-up about the five-star movement and its leader, Pepe Grillo, you see former comedian. Well, at this point, I would say it is an irrelevancy that he's a former comedian. What is relevant is that he's leading a movement that is polling ahead of every other political party, or at least even with every political party in Italy. That would appear to be the most important fact about Mr. Grillo, and not the fact that he was a rather sarcastic stand-up comic at one time. However, you cannot... It's hard to gainsay our media with their rather trivial obsessions. Okay. He also is anti-EMU and to a varying degree anti-European Union. Now, that election has not been called. There's sort of a there's a caretaker president in a prime minister in Italy right now. But it has to be called, I believe, by 2018, and it would seem very likely that the Italians will also go to the polls. Maybe they'll go when I'm going to be there. I'm actually going to take my family to Italy. I am of Italian extraction. You know, I have relatives in parts of Italy that we visit periodically and have for many times over the years. They've never met my kids, uh, who are only eight, so I want to. We're taking them to Italy this summer. Um, so the thrust. The energy, the intellectual energy, the populist energy in Europe is currently very much on the side of the questioners of EU and globalism. I'm going to read a quote. This is from an article uh, from Real Clear Politics by a man named Kevin Sullivan. I believe he's one of their editors. And it's called titled The Lonely Lament of the Globalists. And this is about the, uh, the sixth paragraph in. I'm going to, it's a quote from Kevin Sullivan. By practically every available metric, poverty, prosperity, education, and life expectancy, just to name a few, the world has become a safer, healthier, and happier place. This is true, notwithstanding the crises and atrocities that fill our Facebook feeds and television screens. The increased interdependence and convergence of not only markets, but of mores and modern ways of thinking have undoubtedly contributed, I will me put the other thing, what philosopher Peter Singer referred to in scholar Steven Pinker, later popularized as the escalation of reason. I was going to leave that out because that's very judgmental, but I'll leave it in have undoubtedly contributed to what amounts to a net gain for mankind. The credo of the globalists, the credo of the bureaucrats, the credo of the anti-Brexit people, the credo of the parties running against Gert Wilders, of the establishment parties in France, of the establishment parties in the United States, both Democrats and Republicans. In Italy, what is going on? On a statistical economic basis, it's very difficult to gainsay that statement. 
the world is over the last generation infinitely wealthier with a much wider distribution of goods with emerging middle classes in in many countries around the world which never had them before so what is going on is there some sort of massive electoral delusions which are seeping into the water systems what is going on why is this emotional movement and you have to remember elections are primarily emotional events the idea i know much touted by various parties and others of giving the government over to technocrats is a foolish and almost an adolescent and childish idea. One, people don't work like that. Two, all major decisions at the level of, of high government policy cannot be made technocratically because they all involve moral judgments. What's the best way to grow an economy? What's the best way to provide support for people who need it in the country? These, are, these end up being moral decisions. And so they need to be based on a, a idea of morality. There is no technical, there is no technically correct level for welfare or something along those lines. So the parties and the technocrats are always absolutely shocked when it turns out that the voters are voting on other consideration than what they consider. It's that silly worth. Um, phrase that you hear, oh, the voters are voting against their best interests. That's one of the, pardon me, dumbest things that is ever said about an electorate. How could you possibly know? To those who say it. So what is going on with the electorates around the world? Now, to bring the focus closer, and I'm just trying to illustrate that this is hardly a European issue. To bring the focus back to Britain, to the European Union, I think what you're seeing here is a function of two things. One is structural, and that is the economic disparity in the continent and the effect that the euro and a single interest rate policy had on, on economies in Europe. And it simply has not been a well-balanced effect. And two, a much more emotional issue, I think you are seeing the effect of the failure of Western, I'm not gonna pin the blame anywhere, a policy in the Middle East, certainly in Syria, and the wave of refugees, millions, permitted entry by the Germans. Germany, in essence, on a national level, decided on immigration policy for the EU. From a political point of view, that was an enormous mistake. I am not talking in any sense a humanitarian view. I'm not going to participate in that discussion. Uh, that's not the topic here. But from a political point of view, it was a huge mistake because it has made it very, very, very clear that the nations of Europe no longer control their immigration policy. Italy didn't vote for this. France didn't vote for this. Holland didn't vote for this. Germany, in a sense, you could say voted for it because they elected Angela Merkel. But nobody else had a say in it. And the resentments that are built up over that are huge. One of the underlying themes here, which we are, which have really gotten very little commentary, is that the peoples of these various countries believe in their democratic systems. They believe that they, as a whole, should be the ones to elect the governments to make these decisions. That was one of the profound things that should 
be taken from the Brexit vote, and it wasn't. And I think you're seeing the same thing across the continent now. They did not vote for these policies, and a large majority, a large minority, we don't know how large, it may be a majority, don't want them. And it is useless to make arguments saying they should if they don't. These types of changes need to take place slowly. Culture evolves in many cases, not all, slowly. Okay, so the tenor of the European Union is undergoing a profound shift here, I think. And I would say the emotional catalyst has been the flooding of several million European, uh, Middle Eastern refugees into Europe. There's also been, of course, the various terrorist attacks, especially in France, where there have been quite a few horrific ones. That in that have certainly affected the emotional tenor of these issues. Okay, now, so we've dealt with both those two topics. Let's look now, We all, I think we all know, and that's what this map represents, uh, the purpose and the founding of the European Union. And what is the European Union? Oh, you know what, hold on one second. I want to bring up, uh, I actually forgot, apologies. Bring up the chat here to make sure that we can utilize it for its purpose. Okay, here we go. Yes, I just brought up the chat. My apologies, I forgot to bring it up. Um, if anyone has any comments, criticism, jokes, anything they'd like to share, please put it into chat. I'm monitoring it. I will be glad to take up the topic. Okay, let me bring up another chart here. It's not quite as descriptive, but I think it has some use. Application window. Da, 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 da. Okay. You know what? I'm going to go back to the other chart. Same thing. But I think it's a little bigger and it gives you a better idea. Okay. Purpose of the EU. Well, the purpose of the EU is profoundly political. It is founded, it doesn't on, isn't on this. Uh, map, but it was founded in 1952 with the coal and steel pact between Germany and France. But from the very beginning, uh, with Jean Monnet and others whose concept this was, the idea was overtly, determinedly, I might say utopianly, political. I've said this a number of times, the purpose of the EU was to avoid a repeat of the first 50 years of the 20th century, which if you're looking at European history, were rather disastrous. By binding Germany and France and the rest of Europe in a political and economic union, it was thought and it was hoped that that would never happen again. And I think in that hope, at least up until this point, it has certainly proven to be true. But politicians like generals are always fighting the last war. And it's very debatable whether that is the actual problem. It certainly appeared how could it appear otherwise in 1952, seven years after the end of the most destructive war and the cruelest war, a uh, war which perpetrated things which had never happened before, at least not on that scale. Although you must admit that mankind's penchant for slaughter, cruelty, um, has never been a question. Dredge, um, you know, starting from the earliest organized societies until the German camps in the Second World War, or the Russian gulag, or the Chinese famines, or almost anything you would like to put on scale, 
there has really been no question about mankind's capacity for these things. However, so the purpose of the European Union, as originally formulated, was a federal union, a political and economic entity, if you will, the doing away with European national borders, New Europe, European nationalism. As it evolved, interestingly enough, especially after the reunification of Germany, but what happened was that the European cultures and the European nations became or remained what they always were. Germany is the largest nation in Europe, but not by much. And if you look at that map there, not really geographically. France is just as large and maybe a trifle larger. But the European powers retained their economic place or regained it very quickly. The EU ended up, before the advent of the euro, the balance of power seemed to be relatively balanced between France and Germany in the EU. Since the euro, however, the German economy has done much better than the French economy. And that leads us to the concluding portion of our discussion today. Let's see if I have the quote here. I think I do. Um, yes, it's not a direct quote here. Everyone knows who Wolfgang Schäuble, Schäuble is. He is the German finance minister. So what Mr. Schäuble said um, uh, last, late last week, or maybe it was over the, over the weekend, I believe. Surprisingly enough, he said that the euro is too low. But it's not, of course, his fault or Germany's fault. It's the fault of the ECB for keeping rates too low. Now, this one I am putting under the title of realistic political accommodation. There are also a number of other comments out of the German government that they hoped that Britain would retain its relationship to the EU and that the financial um, abilities of the city of London are very much desired to stay where they are. What's going on here? Germany was leading the charge against Greece um, to force Greece to um, put in a number, all, all those very, very strict controls of its economy and, and plunge Greece basically into poverty, um, which granted is probably where it would be anyway because most of the false the, uh, about Greek economy doesn't didn't mean that it was actually a growing economy. However, it seems to me that the these types of comments from Wolfgang Schäuble and Angela Merkel's government and Angela Merkel as well are an acknowledgement of what is transpiring in Europe. This um, Euro comment might be a specific comment in reply to the comments of the Trump administration, Peter Navarro, that the Germany has been taking advantage of the Euro. Well, you know what? I don't see how you could come up with another interpretation. I have mentioned this a number of times in various venues and in print that one of the results of the euro, of tying a very strong economy like Germany, whose exports are in demand, to a number of relatively weak economies with a relatively weak export base and certainly no industrial one, is that it drags down the value of the euro and it makes Germany's products less expensive than they would be otherwise. Here is a chart, let me find it, of the, oh, here we go. This is a chart of the euro 
and the Deutsche Mark. The Deutsche Mark, is, the euro is on an inverted scale. I just wanted to, because, you know, the dollar, the euro, the Deutsche Mark used to trade USD DEM. So in order to get a better representation, I just reversed the scale on the euro so that they're moving in the same direction. Now, there is no, of course, surprise that the two, that the, the movements of the currencies mimic each other, and that's because, of course, the euro is composed of a set amount, when it was set, of the German mark. Okay, so, but what I wanted to show, and this is the low, this is the high, the low in the, the high in the dollar against the mark. So the mark is strong down here. Okay, that is the type of strength that you would see again were Germany to choose or were the euro to collapse. Okay, let's take another look here. This is not a currency chart. It's an unemployment chart from Europe. Um, more or less on the same scale on either side, not, not completely. But look at the post-2008. Germany did a lot of reform work in its economy back here. Modernized its economy, modernized capital structure, all sorts of stuff like that. Look at that post, and we're talking, of course, about post-financial crisis. This is the, your, the EMU. European Monetary Union, unemployment rate. This is the German. If you want to know one of the two basic problems facing the EU and the EMU, that's it. In France, in Spain, in Italy, the unemployment rate for the generation, I think uh, maybe 15 to 30 or 25 to 30, whatever, 20 to 30 is somewhere 40% or higher. I personally can't imagine what a culture or a life is like if people can't find jobs. Now, there's no pending social revolution in any of these countries. Um, the social structures and the welfare structures in those countries seem to keep mass dissension at bay. On the other hand, is that really true with the pending political votes in Europe? So again, this is one of the main problems right here. And it's not, you know, this is Germany, the result of this and the result of Germany's willingness to reform its economy. But one of the results here is the ascension of German exports because they're relatively cheap. This would not look quite like this were the, were the Germans using the Deutsche Mark because their currency would be much, much stronger and their products would be much more expensive. And the idea that this would not have, I remember reading this, I forget where I read it, somebody's analysis that, well, even if the Germans had the mark, it, it, was, it was an argument that Germany didn't really benefit very much from the weak euro and the pricing of its products. And the, but bar, the, market, the, the argument that the economist was basically making was that demand for German products is inelastic because there's a, such high quality. So even if the mark uh, caused them to be twice as much money, he didn't say that, caused them to be considerably more money as far as a trade weighted, uh, a trade price goes, they wouldn't really affect the outlook. And frankly, that's nonsense. It's simply not true. Um, Yes, Mercedes and BMWs are good cars, but there are many other good cars around the world too. And even if they're not quite as good, I can guarantee you that at a large margin, people at the margins would be dissuaded from buying German products by much higher prices. So the idea that Germany doesn't benefit direct employment in the economy, income, all the things that we think are useful to an economy um, that they don't benefit from the lower, the weak euro is preposterous. Of course they do. And it is, is exemplified 
by Mr. Schreibel saying the, the euro is too low. Well, it's too low for what? It's too low because it is making it evident to all of Europe's other electorates that are voting this year and also to Donald Trump's um, administration that we need to defray some of these this blame on the European economy, uh, on, on the German economy as a representative of what's wrong with Europe. And that is why, Mr. Schäuble, the um, Merkel administration is out there blaming the ECB. I mean, it's rather preposterous to blame the ECB for this. Now, granted, Germany did not want to do bond purchases to do their, uh, their quantitative easing program. Germany was against lowering rates. Excuse me, as low of, as as much as they have lowered them. So I mean, there is some historical continuity to what the Germans are saying. But I think two things are at play here for Germany. Germany as the strongest member of the EU. One is countering or admitting, if you will, the some of the anti-globalization or unfair globalization arguments um, that are starting to come out of the Trump administration. You know, one thing you must remember is that quote that I read in the beginning about the absolute effects um, of globalization. Um, it's very difficult to disentangle results, say, from a trade agreement um, and globalization as a whole. The ability to build and manufacture everywhere around the world is not going to go away. And one thing that is true is that the economy that existed in the United States and the world when NAFTA was signed is no longer the economy that exists today. There can be no question that the economy that NAFTA and other agreements like that have in many ways gutted manufacturing or at least severely damaged manufacturing and manufacturing employment here. The argument of the globalists, of course, is that despite the losses there, what, you, what the country as a whole gets back is more of a benefit and is a plus overall. On many statistical basis, that would be very hard to say is untrue. However, as I've said a number of times, and my contention is, as we can see playing out in politics, that is not the whole story. And the resentments of large bodies of voters in the West cannot be ignored by governments. And we're seeing that now. So how does this bring us back to the Euro and the EU? In this one, we can't quite be sure. It depends. Will, but I think we can be sure of one thing. The structures, and you know, it's hard to see how this is going to work. But the greater the threats to the European, to the e, to the euro, the greater the threats to the European Union. We don't know yet how strong these threats will be, but there is, in my mind, a very, very real question as to whether the EU and the EMU can reform itself in two, in two senses. One, does it want to? 
is there a constituency within the EU and the European Monetary Union's governing bureaucracies to force this? I would say no, there isn't. I would say by and large, these are true believers. And two, and I think is a more profound question, is there anything that could actually be done? The European Monetary Union is the best example. I mean, the European Union can always revert back to being a free trade organization, a borderless trade organization, which is one of its great successes. Probably, in my mind, its greatest success. The euro is not that great a success. It looked great until it was tested, and now it's a source of endless dissension and problems. So the European Union itself has choices. Does the European Monetary Union have choices? And I have my doubts about that. What could, and let's perform a thought experiment. What could, what's the alternative to a euro? A two-speed euro? One euro for Italy and Portugal and Spain and a few others and another euro? Well, that's the end of the euro. There is no euro. Uh, a stronger European, uh, uh, Germ take Germany's complaint. Well, rates are too low. Okay. So the, the European, uh, the European Union, or the ECB starts raising rates because they're too low. It stops its purchase program. The euro goes up to, you know, 110, 115. What's the effect on that? Well, it may be seem fair for Germany. But what would it be? What would it, what would the effect of that be for what's left of the French tour? I mean, the uh, Greek tourist industry, or the French wine industry, or the Italian car industry? If suddenly their products outside the EU, now granted, a lot of it is within the EU, so there's less effect of interest rates than we would imagine. But what got exports to the United States? If the car is already expensive, we're 20% more. Maybe it would have a marginal effect on the exports of Mercedes and BMW, but I do not believe that it would have a marginal effect on the export of Fiat's. So the Europeans, because of this continent-wide, zone-wide interest rates, there do, does not appear to me to be a great deal of flexibility no matter how much pressure the euro comes under from national dissenters okay let us think about one other thing and that would be what would be the likely response of the people who run the Europe, the European, to a exit vote, just hypothetically, in both in in uh, the Netherlands, in France, and let's let's posit Italy as well. Let's just say it, the Netherlands votes to leave. They elect Gert Wilders. They vote to leave the EU. France elects Marine Le Pen. Let us not say, as everyone in the United States said, everyone who was in the media, it can't happen. It can. And so France also votes to leave, elects Marine Le Pen, as, and elects to leave the European Monetary Union, and Italy elects the Five Star Movement and does the same thing. Before even the negotiations for these things would get started. How would this play out and what could be the possible response of the European Monetary Union and the ECB and the national governments behind it? And it would seem to me that the very lack of ideas, proposals for this is a very worrisome thing. There is no backup plan for the euro that I can tell. 
the amount of chaos on the markets would be astronomical. It would cost the European economies dearly in terms of output, in terms of unemployment, and in terms of general economic distress. It may be that the greatest argument for retaining the euro is the inability to get rid of it. Okay, folks, on that note, not a positive one, I'm afraid, but I think a realistic one. I'm going to uh, end the discussion here today. I thank you all very much for attending. I hope this was useful and thought-provoking. There are dire times ahead of us. Good for trading, though. And we will do this again next week. I'd like to thank FX Street, of course, for providing the facilities to do this. Uh, I'm Joseph Trevisani for Worldwide Markets, and we will see you again in a week. Thank you very much. I'll put my email address uh, on the board here. If anyone has any comments or criticisms or anything else that they'd like to contribute, please send me an email, and I'll be glad to respond. Again, thank you very much for attending, and everyone have a great day.